Hello friends, good afternoon and welcome to EduSat Live Lectures. Dear friends, today in the topic of genetics, we will be discussing sex determination in humans and other animals. To discuss this topic, we have with us our subject expert, Dr. Charu Dogra Rawat. Dr. Rawat is Assistant Professor in Department of Zoology in Ramjas College, University of Delhi. Without further ado, I would like to welcome ma'am to our studios and request her to start the lecture. Welcome ma'am. Thank you. Uh, in most diploid eukaryotic organisms, sexual reproduction is a norm where the offspring is produced by the fusion of two gametes, one coming from each parents, the parents that are designated as male and female. So today in this session, we'll understand about the basis of this sexual differentiation, particularly in humans. The specific objectives for the Today's session would be to understand the sex differentiation in humans, the occurrence of male and female, and to understand the genetic mechanism of this sex differentiation, or basically how the sex is determined. Now, when a woman gets pregnant, the first question that comes into the mind of the parents is, is it going to be a boy or a girl? It is not disclosed until the baby is born and the nurse discloses by looking at the external genitalia. There are a number of anatomical differences between a male and a female. The external genitalia in male is a penis and a scrotum, and in female it is clitoris and labia. The gonads, testes in males and ovary in females. The internal accessory structures differ, the epididymis and vas deferens in case of males, and the fallopian tube or uterus in case of females. The gametes that the male produces are called as sperms and the female produces what are called as egg. The gametes are morphologically distinct. In fact, the male and the female are called because there is an, an isogamy in the production of the gametes and the one with the bigger gamete or the egg is termed the female and the one with a smaller gamete is termed the male. And this is followed throughout the animal kingdom. However, what is the sex when the adult is an embryo? There is no anatomic difference in the early embryo. As you can see, the sexually indifferent, there is no differences in the reproductive organs. In fact, the gonads are termed as the bipotential gonads because they can give rise to either the male gonads, which is the testes, or the female gonads, which is the ovary. The six-week human embryo, sexually indifferent. The gonad is the first structure to different between sexes. Around eight to nine weeks in case of males, and around 14 weeks in case of females, the sexually dif distinction occurs. The testes develop in case of males, and ovaries develop in case of females, followed by the development of all other different structures and disappearance of certain common structures which are present in the, in, in the early embryo. So the gonad is the first structure to different between the sexes. So bipotential gonads give rise to testes and ovary. These testes or ovary produces sex hormones which finally give rise to a male adult or a female adult. The term sex determination is used for the initial event that determines whether the gonad will develop as the testes or ovaries. And sex differentiation is used for the subsequent events that ultimately produces either the male or the female sexual phenotype. Further, there is primary sexual differentiation which involves only the gonads where the gametes are produced. So structural differentiation of the gonads is termed as primary sexual differentiation. And the secondary sexual differentiation involves the overall appearance of the organism, including clear differences in such organs such as memory glands and external genitalia as well as in the other non-reproductive organs. 
So if we look at the history, the obvious since long time that members of a species exist in two fundamental forms, that is they are sexually dimorphic. But not until the 20th century, it was found that the genes are responsible for sex determination. So this distinction between the male and female used to be thought before the Mendel works, the gene concept came into being. The heredity was thought as a blending process. The male and female, as I was talking about, they produce gametes which fuse together to produce the offspring, which is the next generation. So the male characters and coming from the father and the female characters coming from the, fr from the mother were thought of as kind of a blending together and giving rise to the child's characteristics. However, the sex determination could not be based on that. Initially, the focus was on the environment. In around circa 330 BC, Aristotle proposed that probably the heat of the male partner during intercourse determines sex. Higher the heat, a male is born. In 1890s, the prevailing model was that the mother's diet during pregnancy determined sex of the child. And in fact, there were a lot of ideas such as the sex depends on the phase of the moon, the state of the economy, war or peace times and economic times and all those kind of things used to prevail that that is how the distinction in a male and female occurs. It was not until late when the, in 1900s when sex chromosomes were discovered. The environmental theories of sex determination were popular until then, but then the sex of the offspring is found to be determined by these specific chromosomes. Let's look at the discovery of the sex chromosomes. Henking in Hermann Henking in 1891 studied spermatogenesis in fire wasp pyrochorus and noted a darkly stained nucleolar body in the first meiotic division that did not devise in meiotic II and appeared to remain in one of the daughter cells produced. He called this an X element. In 1898, the X element came up, up, came up again. Charles Irwin McClung studied spermatogenesis in grasshopper, found something similar to Henking's X element but this was now present in the male and he called it as the accessory chromosome and he thought because it is confined to male that it was a male determining factor. The Nettie Stevens while working on the mealworm noted the existence of different chromosomes that she called as heterochromosomes in the male and the female. There is a distinct heterochromosome found in males and females in females, the homologous heterochromosomes pair during meiosis 1. However, in males, there is only a single heterochromosome. In some males, though, the heterochromosome pair with a smaller heterochromosome in the first meiotic division. At the same time, the similar discovery was noted by Edmund Beecher Wilson, who separately noted the presence of these distinct chromosomes in males and females. The males and females of some species have different chromosome numbers, with females having two copies of these distinct chromosomes and males having a single copy. Whereas males and females of some other species had identical chromosome number, where the males had a much smaller chromosome that paired with a larger chromosome that is find, found twice in the ogonia of the females. He initially called these two non-homologous chromosomes as idiochromes, but then he later changed it to the X chromosome for idiochrome that was found both in males and females and Y chromosome for the idiochromes that are found in males. So the sex chromosomes were discovered, the entities which were different in the males and the females. So what determines the sex in the humans? The first attempt to understand the sex determination occurred around 100 years ago. And that involved visual examination of the chromosomes in the dividing cells. So we have seen that the chromosomes can be identified in the cells and therefore these sex chromosomes were distinguished and the sex determination also involved the visual examination of chromosomes. In 1912, Winnie Water counted 47 chromosomes in a spermatogonial metaphase preparation. And the females, he thought, were supposed to have one extra chromosomes and therefore 48 chromosomes. 
In the 1920s, scientists by the name of Theophilus Painter counted between 45 and 48 chromosomes in the cells of testicular tissue and also discovered the smaller Y chromosome. Later, however, he concluded incorrectly that 48 was the chromosome number in both males and females. It was until 1956 when John Johan Tijo and Albert Levan showed that 46 was indeed the human diploid number. The Ford and John L. Hamilton, also working with the testicular tissue, confirmed this finding. So 46 was the human diploid number. The traditional human karyotypes for a normal male and a normal female looked like this. So a normal male, normal male had 22 pair autosomes plus two sex chromosomes, an X and a Y. And a normal female had 22 pair autosomes plus two of the sex, same type of X chromosomes, same type of sex chromosomes called the X chromosomes. Now there could be still two possibilities. The presence of two X is giving the femaleness and the absence of one X is giving the maleness or the presence of Y determines the maleness. Because if you look at the normal female karyotype, then one X is present in both the individuals. However, the occurrence of another X gives femaleness, but in the male and there is an occurrence of Y chromosome. So it needed to be determined that what is the mechanism. To understand this more, there was two human abnormalities that were characterized that had aberrant sexual development. The two abnormalities were Klinefelter syndrome in which the individuals have genitalia and internal ducts that are male but their testes are rudimentary and fails to produce sperm, so basically sterile males. But they also had the feminine sexual development which is not entirely suppressed. There is slight enlargement of the breasts, a term gynecomestia is common and the hips are also often rounded. Another human abnormality was the Turner syndrome. The individuals had female external genitalia and the internal ducts but the ovaries are rudimentary. The individuals usually have a short stature, usually under 5 feet, cognitive impairment, skin folds on the back of the neck and underdeveloped breasts. A broad shield-like chest was noted. So looking at the karyotype of these two syndromes, the Klinefelter syndrome had 47 total number of chromosomes in which there were 22 pair of autosomes plus an two X's and a Y. So 47 XXY was the karyotype. And for the Turner syndrome had 45 only chromosomes and there was just a single sex chromosome called the X and there was no other sex chromosome which was found. So the karyotypes of the two abnormalities resulted from the non-disjunction, the failure of the X chromosomes to segregate properly during meiosis. So while combining and separating, the three two X chromosomes went to one daughter nuclei whereas there was none chromosome going to the next one. So the gametes were produced containing two X chromosomes and none X chromosomes. And when they combined with the other ones, they gave rise to the condition where there was an XXY and an X syndrome such as in the Turner syndrome case. So this clearly revealed that Y chromosome determines the maleness and thus is the basis for phenotypic sex determination in humans. The Klinefelter syndrome, the presence of Y, introduced the male characters in a female, the female which was not sexually active and but had the occurrence of the male characters in it. The Turner syndrome, where the absence of Y was there, the male also produced, uh, the initial characters were male because there was a single X chromosome, but the absence of Y made the male characters rudimentary. The testes were rudimentary, the males were sterile and in fact a little of female characterization was also there. So the females had male characters and the males had female characters in the case of Klinefelter and Turner syndrome clearly depicting that the Y chromosome determines the maleness 
and thus is the basis of phenotypic sex determination in humans. Now we have understood about the three levels of sexual dimorphism. There is a genetic sex, so there is a difference between the two individuals. XY is a male and XX is a female. There is a gonadal sex where the male has testes as the gonads and the female has ovaries as the gonads. And the phenotypic sex where one individual is designated as a male and the other is designated as a female bearing the uh, such characteristics. So the, if you look at this, then the gametic sex will define if a male is having an XY or if female is having an XX chromosome. So the genetic constitution of the cell will lead in 6 to 8 weeks to, for the gonads to develop into testes. So the cells surrounding the gonadal region, if they constitute, the genetic constitution is XY chromosome, the gonads will develop into testes. These gonads will produce testosterone as well as the Sertoli cells of the testes will produce a Mullerian inhibiting factor. The testosterone will give rise to the formation of the Wolfian ducts and the male reproductive tract constituting the internal genitalia and it will also influence for the formation of the external genitalia by 9 to 12 weeks. And Mullerian inhibiting factor will make sure that the Mullerian ducts regresses and therefore this will lead to the formation of a male. And if the surrounding cells contain XX as the constitution, the gonads in around 9 weeks will develop into ovaries. There will be no testosterone and there will be no Mullerian inhibiting factor and therefore the Wolfian ducts will regress. The genitalia will transform into the, into the genitalia of females and there will be external genitalia. The Mullerian ducts will, uh, will be formed or will remain and therefore it will lead to the formation of the female reproductive tract, tract and internal genitalia will be of the female leading to the production of a female. So this is how the genetic constitution of the cell that whether it contains an XX chromosome or it contains an XY chromosome the production of the male or the female is governed. However, there are apparent exceptions to the rule that Y is sex determining. Now, what part of the Y determines the maleness? To find that out, there were certain exceptions to the rule that Y was the sex determining. And in those, the XX was a male and XY was a female. So they could find out people which had a genetic constitution of XX, but they were males. The external genitalia, the gonads and the internal accessory structures were all of a male. They had penis and scrotum, they had testes as the gonads, they had epidynamis and vest afferents, but they were sterile. They neither produced sperms nor produced the egg. Similarly, they could identify certain females where the genetic constitution was XY. And instead of Y giving a male characteristics, it was a female. The external genitalia had clitoris and labia, there was ovary, there was fallopian tube, uterus, but again it was sterile, there was no production of the gametes, there was no egg and there was no sperm production. So now look into the detail of what's, what's there. Then it was seen that some XY females are missing the part of the Y chromosome. They said that the XX females are probably the XX constituting uh, organisms are males because they might be carrying certain part of the Y chromosome. And they could see that on the top panel there is an XY and a typical Y chromosome which is there. And the XX which turned out to be male had certain portions, the tip portions of the, the, the X chromosomes had certain portions of the Y chromosomes on them. And in fact, the XY, which turned out to be a female, missed those parts. So this part of the Y chromosome is actually governing the maleness. So if you look into the detail of the structure of the human Y chromosome, it has these pseudo-autosomal regions at the end of the, uh, at the tips of the chromosome. And they can, you know, synapse and recombine with the, in the, with the autosomal fashion. And then there is a sex determining region called as the SRY which is located on the small arm at towards one side of the region. And this entire region was called as the male specific region of the Y chromosome apart from the par regions. 
This MSY region is divided into the euchromatic as well as the heterochromatic part and the short arm euchromatic region was containing the sex determining region or SRY gene. This gene was actually responsible for the maleness of the individual and it was easily shown by this transgenic experiment that when an XX mouse embryo carrying SRY transgene develops testes and as a male. So they took a fertilized egg where the genetic constitution is XX and they introduced this SRY gene into the fertilized egg. The transgenic egg therefore had XX plus this SRY gene component which got integrated into the chromosome. It was placed into the uterus of the foster mother and the embryonic development and birth was done in the normal manner. And when the transgenic mouse was produced, it was a male. So with the genetic constitution of XX, a male could be produced by the incorporation of this SRY region into the chromosomes. So SRY was the region responsible for governing the maleness and it is present on the Y chromosome. Therefore, the presence of Y chromosome governs the occurrence of the male in case of humans. Now, if you look at the genes that are involved, then in bipotential gonads, there are a number of transcription factors which are there, such as SF1, WT1 and etc, GATA4 etc, which are all there, the transcription factors which are there. Then in case of males, there will be an SRY gene product, which is a DNA binding protein. This SRY or a DNA binding protein will bind to the downstream genes which are responsible for the male characteristics. One of the target genes that has been found is called as the SOX9. So SRY will go into the nucleus and will bound into the SOX9. The SOX9 is basically influenced by the FGF9 which causes the cell migration, the coelomic proliferation, the Sertoli cell differentiation and the cord organization. So the sex differentiation is occurring. Now in the presence of Importen and Calmodulin, the SOX9 which is present in the cytoplasm will be transferred to the nucleus and then SRY will act on the SOX9 genes and therefore it will release a lot of testis determining factors. These testis determining factors such as SF1, WT1, GATA4 and HSP70, heat shock protein 70 will lead to the formation of testes. It will also influence the production of the anti-Mullerian hormone or AMH which will cause the Mullerian duct to regress. So from a bipotential gonad, the Mullerian duct will regress, the male characteristics or the male structures will form and therefore it will lead to the formation of a male. And if you look at in the females, there is no SRY gene product which is there. Sex determination, there are different factors such as WNT4 or DAX1. This DAX1 is basically inhibiting the SRY message production or processing and it is also inhibiting the male or testis determining factors such as SF1, WT1 and HSP70 as I said and inhibition of the testis determining factors or testis differentiation leads to the ovary differentiation. So there will be an enhancement of ovary determining factors and in the females, the absence of SRY lead to the formation of the female characteristics and a female will be developed. So sexual differentiation in humans is basically an XXXY mechanism. The XX chromosome when they are present will lead to the formation of a female but X and Y chromosome coming one from each of parent will give rise to a male progeny. Now if you can see then there, is, there are two X chromosomes in the females. We will go into the detail that how these genes are basically compensated but just to review that presence of two X chromosomes there will be a double dose of all the genes which are present on the X chromosome. The Y chromosome contain very less amount of genes. SRY gene which is very important for the maleness is present and some of the genes are present which are involved in the testes differentiation but as we just saw, saw in the genetic constitution or genetic influence on the testes differentiation most of the nuclear gene products are used for the differentiation of the 
male characteristics, they are also involved. So the double dose of X chromosome is present in females, whereas there is a single X chromosome which is present in males. To compensate for this in humans, one of the X chromosome is condensed. So it is condensed so that to remain the dose of genes present in both males and females to be constant. This condensation is achieved by heterochromatinization and the condensed chromatin is called as the bar body after the name of the, its discoverer bar. This heterochromatinization is random. As soon as in the progeny the XX chromosome constituted cell is there, one of the X will condense and the other X will remain. In the next round of cycle, the other X can be condensed and the condensed in the earlier one can be decondensed in the next cycle. So there is a dosage compensation which basically occurs. Now if you look at this that because a male forms two gametes and a female also forms two gametes which are haploid containing either X, X or either X or Y, the sex ratio in humans should be 1. The sex ratio is defined as the actual proportion of male to the female offspring because there is a 50-50 percent chance for the male to be occurring or female to be occurring. The primary sex ratio reflects the proportion of males to females conceived in a population. However, secondary sex ratio reflects the proportion of each sex that is born. So there is a difference between these two terms. The primary sex ratio, the proportion of the males to the females conceived. So ideally, there is a 50 percent chance for the conceiving a male or a female. However, the choice or the, uh, the, uh, the contribution depends upon the male because they contribute the maleness determining factor which is the Y chromosome. The secondary sex ratio however reflects the proportion of each sex that is born. So it is very easy to uh, calculate the secondary sex ratio by looking at the number of males or females that are born. But it is observed that secondary sex ratio is greater than 1 and the primary sex ratio is also greater than 1. The secondary sex ratio is greater than 1 because there might be the survival rate of males more than the females. But at the conception there should be equal. But the primary sex ratio is also greater than 1 indicating that there is a chance of male progeny to be surviving more than the female progeny which is there. To understand this, we have to look for the assumptions which we made for the theoretical sex ratio to be 1. It is based on the following assumptions that because of the segregation, males produce equal numbers of X and Y bearing sperm. Each type of sperm then has the equivalent viability and motility in the female reproductive tract. And the egg surface is equally receptive to both X and Y bearing sperm. So there is no bias at any stage. At every stage, it is equal number of uh, sperms that are produced containing X or Y, equal number of fusions that is occurring. And then the egg surface is equally receptive for both the X and Y bearing sperms. However, the Y is smaller in structure. It has less of mass. So it is speculated that the Y bearing sperm are more motile than X bearing sperm and therefore the probability of a fertilization event leading to a male zygote is increased. So that is one of the speculation which says otherwise the sex ratio should be 1 but it is not and the probable reason is that maybe because the Y is a smaller structure it has less mass the sperm that is carrying Y chromosome is more swift and it has more tendency and viability and motility in the female reproductive tract and therefore the egg surface is also more receptive for a Y bearing sperm. And therefore this reflects the difference in the primary sex ratio which is greater than 1 in case of the human beings which is there. So sex depends upon the genetic constitution, it is a genetic sex determination in humans. The XX give rises to a female and XY give rises to a male. If the X number of chromosomes are increasing in a male, then the female characteristics are increased. But the presence of Y will lead to the maleness. 
and particularly in Y, the region or the gene called as the SRY will govern this maleness in the humans which is there. session we'll talk about sex determination in animals apart from humans. So humans we saw that the sex is determined by XXXY mode of determination where XX produces a female and XY produces a male and it is a genetic sex determination which is there. So we'll look at the other animals that how the sex is determined in the entire animal kingdom. So the learning objectives of this session would be to understand the genetic sex determination mechanisms in animals other than humans and to also understand the environmental sex determination mechanisms where the sex of an individual is influenced by the environment. So heterogametic sex is you was males that produce unlike gametes and their gametes ultimately determine the sex of the progeny in those species. The homogametic sex were females and they produce uniform gametes with regard to chromosome number and type like XX in case of humans and XY in case of for the males. There was there is a uh, when Wilson was working on the uh, ligus meal bug the bug it uh, found out that they also have this XXXY mode of sex determination. But the XX is a female there are 12 autosomes plus 2X and the gamete is formed giving rise haploid gamete, 6 autosomes plus X and the XY is containing the male. So, so it has the similar kind of a uh, XX, XY sex determination as found in the humans. So the male will have the genetic constitution of XY. The gametes will contain either an X or a Y which will fuse with the X gamete from the female and will give rise to the male and the female in 1 is to 1 sex ratio. He was also working on Protanor which was a butterfly and he, divide, he, he found that there was another mode of sex determination which was followed and it was termed as XX XO mode of sex determination. The female was an XX, there were 12 autosomes plus 2 sex chromosomes. However, the male had only a single X chromosome which was there. That is, there were 12 autosomes plus an X chromosome. There was no Y chromosome in this case. So the gametes it produces was one containing 6 autosomes plus 1 X chromosome. However, 6 autosomes with no X chromosome. So this is a condition similar to the Turner syndrome which is there in the human beings. So when they combine, then the males and the females are again produced in the 1 is to 1 sex ratio. And this kind of determination is termed as XXXO mode of sex determination. This is found in case of the worm Cenorhabditis elegans, which is a mod which is used as a model organism for the studies of genetics. The C. elegans exists in two forms. There is a smaller male which produces sperm, and there is a larger hermaphrodite. There is no female, but there is a hermaphrodite which is initially female to start with. But as it grows, it starts producing sperms also. So it is a hermaphrodite which is there. The outcome of the self-fertilization in a hermaphrodite and a mating of a hermaphrodite and a male worm is like this. When the hermaphrodite, the genetic constitution of 2X chromosomes self-fertilizes, then 99% of the times it gives rise to a hermaphrodite. But 1% of the time it can give rise to a male where there is a single X chromosome and there is no other X chrom uh, sex chromosome which is there. If you cross fertilize these hermaphrodites and males, this will give rise to 1 is to 1 ratio between the hermaphrodites and the males which is there. So one mechanism of determining the sex is by counting of chromosomes. 
particularly the sex chromosomes. If there are two X chromosomes, then it is going to be a hermaphrodite or it is a hermaphrodite. And if there is only one X chromosome, then it is a male. So the embryos with one X becomes male, while those with two become females that eventually becomes the hermaphrodites. There is another mechanism in case of cell, in case of C. elegans for sex determination, which is termed as ratio of X is to A sex determining signal. So X is the sex chromosome and A is the autosomes. So the ratio of the sex chromosome to the autosomes also determines the sex in the case of C. elegans. So if this ratio is 1, for example, if there are two X, autosome, two X chromosomes and double the set of autosomes are present, there are two autosomes and two X chromosomes are present, the ratio is 1 and therefore it will give rise to a hermaphrodite. But if this ratio of X chromosome to the autosomes is anywhere ranging between 0.5 to 0.67, then it will give rise to a male. Particularly, they say that there is an uh, X specifying element and there is an autosomal specifying element. So, X specifying element will inhibit the master switch, the master uh, determining uh, product which is XOL1 and will give rise to the hermaphrodite, whereas the autosomal will influence this. In the case of when there is a single X chromosome and there is no other chromosome which is present and the ratio is lying between 0.5, then it will activate the XOL1 gene and therefore a male will be produced. So this is a very interesting example where the ratio of the X chromosome to the autosomes will also determine the sex of the individual. And anywhere in between the ratios ranging from 0.67 to 1 will give rise to an intersex kind of a thing, the herm which will be basically a sterile animal that will be formed. There is another mode of sex determination which is usually found in birds and it is termed as ZZ and ZW, ZZ or ZW mode of sex determination. So the birds usually do not have X and Y chromosome, but they are designated as Z and W chromosomes which are there. In this case, the female is the heterogametic sex as unlike in humans where the female was a homogametic sex. So female is a heterogametic sex and the constitution is ZW, whereas the male is a homogametic sex and the constitution is ZZ. The examples include certain moths and butterflies, some fish, reptiles, amphibians and at least one species of plants and as I said most of the birds follows the ZZZW mode of sex determination. In fact, DMRT1 gene is found to be located on the Z chromosome. The product of this DMRT1 gene is a critical member of the testes forming pathway and two copies of this gene leads to the male formation. So two copies of the DMRT1 gene will lead to the differentiation into males, while as, whereas the single dose of this DMRT1 gene which is present on the Z chromosome will lead to the formation of a female. So this is another mode of sex determination which is there. Now we look at the sex determination in Drosophila. In Drosophila, there is again XX, XY determination of mechanism, determin sex determination mechanism. The females constitute XX and the male constitutes XY. However, the, in 1916, Calvin Bridges concluded that the Y chromosome is not involved in sex determination in Drosophila and we will just look at how he concluded this. Because it is having a similar kind of, as far as the genetic constitution is concerned, it is having the similar kind of sex determination mechanism as found in humans, the XX, XY mode of uh, sex determination. But in this case, Y chromosome is not involved in the sex determination. The critical factor in determining the sex is the ratio of the X chromosome to the number of haploid sets of autosomes which is present, just like we saw in the case of C. elegans. So the X chromosome, the sex chromosome and A, X is to A ratio governs the formation of a male or a female. So first we will look at why the Y chromosome is not involved in sex determination. So you can see that this is one of the cross where there is a non-disjunction that occurs. 
And as we saw that the occurrence, the XXY, the in the Kleinefelter filter and Turner syndrome, the maleness was governed by the Y chromosome. So, maleness was given by the Y chromosome if it is present in an XX female. In this case, if a female parent containing XX genotype and a male parent XY, if they are crossed and there is a non-disjunction that occurs in female, however, in male there occurs a normal meiosis, then the gametes that will be formed in female, one will contain two sets of X chromosomes, so, however, one will, there will be no sex chromosome found in one of the gametes. Male will produce equal number of gametes containing X chromosomes and the other gametes containing Y chromosomes. So, the FY genotype, the triploid will die, the YO will also die because that is lethal, but the, fem the XXY and the XO will survive and they are ana analogous to the Klinefelter syndrome genotype and the Turner syndrome genotype. But in this case, the XXY are females and Y presence of Y is not exhibiting male characters to it. And the XO are males, however, they are sterile. So, Y is not giving the male characters in case of Drosophila. So, the, the XXY genotype are females and XO genotype are males. The Y chromosome is not involved in sex determination in Drosophila. By analysis of the progeny of the triploid females, which have three copies each of the haploid component of chromosomes, Bridges understood better the sex determination in case of Drosophila. The triploid females apparently originate from rare diploid eggs fertilized by the normal haploid sperm. And now you can see that the ratio of the X chromosome to autosome sets will give rise to different kind of sexual phenotypes. When this ratio is 1, for example, in the case of 2X, 2A or 3X, 3A, it is a normal female. So, the two sets of autosomes plus XY give rise to a normal male. So, when there is a single X chromosome and two sets of autosome, the ratio is 0.5 or when there is an XY chromosome or two sets of autosomes, the ratio is again 0.5, then it give rise to a male. But when the ratio is 1, it give rise to a female. If the ratio is higher than 1, there are more number of X chromosomes which are present, then it give rise to a metafemale. However, when the ratio is lower than 0.5, when there is more number of autosomes which are present, then it is said to be a meta male. And in between the 0.5 to 1, if ratio lies in between these two values, such as for example in 0.67 ratio or 0.75 ratio, then they are intersexes, they are sterile which are produced. So, there is a correlation between the sexual morphology and the chromosome composition as far as the ratio of the X chromosome to the autosome is concerned. So, sex in case of Drosophila is determined by this ratio which is there. By looking at this, Wilson proposed what is called as a genic balance theory that states that a threshold for maleness is reached when the X is to A ratio is 1 is to 2. That is there is one X chromosome, the other can be Y chromosome and there are two sets of autosome present, the ratio is 0.5. But that the presence of an additional X, if an additional X is present, then the balance is altered and that results in the female differentiation. So, you can see in the figure that when there is a single X chromosome and there are two autosomes, then there is a maleness that occurs. But with the presence of another X chromosome, the balance is disturbed and the femaleness is produced or a female is produced. The main genes and the proteins contributing to the cascade of gene expression leading to the development of males and females in Drosophila are these. When there is a male, then basically the three genes which we talk about in the, in the governing the maleness and femaleness or the production of a male or a female Drosophila are one is the transformer gene which is an autosomal gene. It was discovered by the scientist Alfred H. Strutevant. XLC, SXL which is a sex lethal gene, it is an X linked gene and DSX which is a double sex gene which is again an autosomal gene. So, if there is an X is to A ratio which is equal to 1, then the SXL will be expressed. The expression of SXL will lead to the alternative splicing in case of SXL which will further alternatively splice the tra gene product and therefore activate the DSX 
gene product and the alternative splicing takes place in these which will give rise to the which will go and bind to the female differentiating genes and inhibit the male differentiating genes leading to the formation of the female. But if X is to ra ra A ratio is less which is 0 0.5 then there is no alternative splicing that occurs and the default SXL transcript is there and there will be a default tra transcript which will be there and this default tra product will lead to a normal male governing splicing in the DSX protein in the DSX transcript that will abolish or inhibit the female differentiating genes but will promote the male differentiating genes leading to the formation of the males. So, the interplay of all these uh, molecules as well as the molecular mechanisms which is the alternative splicing for example will lead to the either the formation of a male or a female drosophila. Then there are other different kinds of genic sexual uh, sex determination which are there. One is called as the polygenic sex determination where multiple independently segregating sex switch loci or alleles determine the sex within the species. So, in XX or XY chromosome there was a single gene locus which was playing a role. But in some of the organisms multiple loci governs the determination of the sex. It occurs naturally in various species of insects, mammals, fish and plants and it was first discovered in platyfish, African cichlid fish and zebra fish. So, there is a single polygenic uh, thing which is found in African pygmy mice. It represents a single locus XYW system where the inheritance of a Y by itself determines male development, but this effect is overridden by the presence of a novel W female sex determiner. The system produces one genotypic male class and three genotypic female classes. Multilocus polygenic sex determination is found in African cichlid fish which represents a multilocus system where alleles at an XY locus on chromosome 7 and a ZW locus on chromosome 5 segregate independently. The W allele overrides the Y male determiner such that the ZW XY individuals are female again resulting in one genotypic male class and three genotypic female classes. Additionally, a pigmentation allele tightly linked to the W locus produces a color polymorphism in the female offspring as can be observed. Apart from these results, there can be different results also, but this is how the polygenic sex determination occur. Another system is said to be haploid UV chromosomes, which is found in case of mosses or liverworts. The separate sexes are only found in the haploid phase of the life cycle of an individual. Haploid sex chromosomes are referred to as U for the female and V for the male. And the sex of the haploid offspring determined by whether it carries a U or a V chromosome. However, the diploid stage is always heterogamatic and U and V are always hemizygous in the diploid phase. So, in the diploid phase it is heterogamatic which is UV is present but the haploid stages are either male or female depending upon the presence of either U or a V chromosome. The presence of U chromosome makes it a female whereas the presence of V chromosome makes it a male. In bees, ants and wasps the males develop from unfertilized haploid eggs and females uh, develop from the fertilized diploid eggs giving rise to another sex determination mechanism termed as haplodiploidy. So, this diploid female bee without any going undergoing fertilization give rise to haploid male bees by phenomena termed as aranotoki. However, in case when the diploid female bee gametes and the haploid male bee gametes fuse together they give rise to the diploid female bees which are there. Another form, uh, another mechanism which can be discussed here is called as a complementary sex determination, which basically refers to the example of the mating of a queen with multiple drones with the determined sexes in fertilized and unfertilized egg. So, as can be seen, the unfertilized eggs of the queen will give rise to a drone, which is a male, but when this queen fertilizes with a number of drones, then depending upon the complementary gene of homozygous genotype at one of the locus called as the CST which is a complementary sex determiner whether it will produce a 
worker or a queen or whether it will be lethal is found. So, if you can see then the um, hetero homozygosity at this particular locus can give rise to a queen when the same locus which was present in the queen combines with a similar locus which is present in the drone. The rest of the things will be all male which are workers. But if by chance there occurs a deployed male which is there then it will be killed when it is born. And this is done because the complementary mechanism of sex determination enables the females to control the sex which is the female to the male ratio ensuring out breeding and achieving a close mother daughter genetic relationship features which have facilitated the evolutionary transition to the sociality in bees ants and wasps. So they kill any deployed males that are born so that there is a female to the daughter relationship and the males are only produced by the um, unfertilized egg. So basically they do not have any dad. There is another uh, sex determination mechanism which is called as parental genome uh, elimination and it occurs in males of many scale insect, insects that inactivate or lose their paternal chromosomes. The males are haploid and the females are deployed. So you can see that the females when they undergo meiosis will produce gametes and when they fuse the fertilization occur then categorically there will be, uh, there will be uh, deployed stages which occur but the males will particularly eliminate the parental genome from their, uh, from their fertilized egg and therefore that is how the sex is determined. Apart from the genes there is also what is called as the cytoplasmic sex determination and it is found in certain crustaceans and woodlouse and some plants. The sex is under the control of cytoplasmic elements such as intracellular parasites for example Volbatia in many insects or mitochondria in many flowering plants. So this particular uh, woodlouse uh, follows a typical ZZ, ZW sex, uh, mode of sex determination where ZZ the heterogametic sex is the male and ZW is the female. But when the female is infected by the, uh, the uh, intracellular parasite then there is a cytoplasmic sex determination which occurs because then the males are forced to become females. The presence of this bacteria, this parasite with the ZZ chromosome constitution will lead to the formation of the femaleness. So this is the cytoplasmic sex determination and since it is cytoplasmic the, uh, the parasite is passed on from the mother to the mother. So therefore it will basically enforce the femaleness in the progeny. Then there is another thing which is called as monogeny and all the offsprings of a particular individual in this case the females are either exclusively male or exclusively female for example in gall midges and in some other flies and crustaceans. A single maternal effect autosomal gene for example chromosomal maintenance prevents elimination of paternally derived X chromosome during early stages of embryogenesis so that all the offsprings of CM bearing mothers obtain a female determining karyotype. Absence of the CM usually has opposite effect all the F springs of CM lacking females lose the paternally derived X chromosome and obtain the male determining karyotype. So there is either all the females which are produced or all the males which are produced. This is termed as the monogeny. Then these are all the, fact, uh, all the examples of basically genic site, uh, sex determination where genes are playing a role in the sex determination or either, either the cytoplasmic sex determination. But apart from that there is another sex determination which is called as the environmental sex determination and sex is determined irreversibly by environment experience during early development. The most common is the temperature dependent sex determination found in all crocodiles, most turtles and some lizard. The sex determination is achieved according to the incubation temperature of eggs during a critical period of embryonic development. So for example you can see that in an alligator when the temperature is low there are all females which are there. As the temperature rises the percentage of males increases. So there is an optimal temperature at which there is maximum production of males and below and above temperatures will lead to the formation of females. Similarly in case of a, a turtle then there is a higher temperature leads to the formation of males whereas lower temperature will leads to the formation of female which is there. In some of the pattern uh, this kind of a pattern is seen in various species of crocodile turtles and lizards where 
the median temperature will give rise to a male however the higher temperature or lower temperature will give rise to the females so temperature variation in early development will lead to the formation of either a male or a female the painted turtles the the production of a male or female depends upon the temperature in the nest so that they are all you know same to start with but then at a particular time it will depend upon the temperature of the nest that what they will grow up to so if the temperature is higher the females will be produced if the temperature is lower the males will be produced so that will determine the sex of the individual the temperature in the nest the clownfish you know they uh, sex determination differs with it depends upon the time when they are all males to start with but when they grow they turn into females so in fact if you see a colony there are a number of males there is a hierarchy there is a level there are a number of males at a particular growth level the gro they which are which have grown over a time they are all turned into females the female will then mate with a male to produce the progeny but then the female will die and the male will, will become the female and therefore one from the male level will go up to form the female so in clownfish with time you know the it, the sex determination depends upon the time of the growth another example is spoon worm the bonilia you know in this case the larva when it falls on the sea floor it becomes a female but when the larva falls on the body of the worm it becomes a male so it is a position dependent sex determination if it is falling on the sea floor it is becoming a female but when it is falling on a body of a worm it is depending on a male so we discussed and we saw the examples of sex determination in humans as well as in animals in animals there is a genetic sex determination as well as there is an environmental sex determination where temperatures or position or the growth time governs whether it is going to be a male or a female this sex determination or the differentiation in sex is essential for the sexual reproduction to occur where the meiosis can occur which is basically the uh, root of all the the root of all the variations that occur in the species that would be all thank you uh, on that note i would like to thank ma'am for this very interesting discussion and i would like to thank you dear friends for watching our show stay tuned and keep watching thank you